Hi everyone, this is part two of our discussion with Andrew Puzder. It picks up right where we left off in part one. Welcome back. I think we're, I think we're looking at the Trump boom and uh, it's a result of the capitalist comeback. And, and a lot of that you think is um, what you should buy, go out and buy. Yes, go out and buy, exactly. <laughs> and you think a lot of that, certainly there's the tax cut, but, but some of the effects that you're talking about kicked in before the tax cut was signed into law. And you think a lot of that is uh, what you might call investor confidence or, or just kind of a new, a new spirit of, of, of risk taking that, that, that took hold in boardrooms and among investors. I, I asked, uh, you know, I, I did run a very big company, but, but it was made up of a lot of little companies because we had our franchisees own 95% of the restaurants and everything internationally was franchised. So I, I, I'm still, I was in touch with these people after the election and I went and asked some of them. I say, you know, what do you think's different now? You know, what, what, what's your feeling? And to kind of give a synopsis of their answers, it was, you know, we're not waking up at three o'clock in the morning wondering, you know, what, next, the, what the next big government program is going to be. Are they going to kill more community banks like they would Dodd-Frank? Are they going to shove, uh, you know, health insurance costs down our throats? Is there going to be some new regulation coming? We're not waking up and thinking. We're actually thinking maybe it's time to invest. And that was before President Trump lived up to his promises to cut regulations and uh, to cut taxes. Once he lived up to them, I mean, I, I think we're, we're looking at a very, very bright future economically. So let me zero in on some on some labor market issues that come kind of right out of out of the book. In the book, you state that policy should be focused on helping people in high risk and in minority communities located in large cities to find jobs. Yes, and you you highlight that as as a key priority. Uh, how would we go about doing that? And 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 uh, and I guess also, why do you think it's so important? Well, I think it's important because we, we want. Like I said, the, the proudest day of my career was when I got that 10 cent raise, which really was meaningless to me. I got that promotion to assistant manager and they handed me the key. That, that's the kind of, of dignity and self-respect that, that keeps, would keep these kids in the inner cities uh, out of trouble. And I think it's, it's, an, it's an important experience for them. I think they, there's a, there's a, a, it's, it's difficult to work these jobs in the inner city. You know, companies don't even want to open in the inner city. So we need to encourage companies to open there. We need to try and make sure the kids get training. And it, it, it doesn't have to be college. It doesn't have to be some fancy apprenticeship or internship. It can just be getting, that, getting kids into those entry level jobs so they understand uh, what it is to, to make a living and what it is to uh, be a part of a team or to, to deal with customers. Uh, and we also need to fix the education system. A big part of this is fixing the education system in cities, like cities like Chicago. It's a terrible system. They're, I think they're more politically motivated than they are to motivate, uh, than they are to educate the kids um, in that city. And it, part of it's growing out of the labor unions, the teachers unions that control many of the, um, the school systems and their deep roots in socialism. You, you're, we're, we're not, kids are not being taught what they need to learn to get out and contribute in our society. They're not being taught to respect the opportunities that they had, the opportunities that millions of immigrants came to this country to take advantage of. They're here, uh, but we have to make sure that there's an equal playing field so everybody has a chance to take advantage of those opportunities. And I think some government focus in the inner cities to bring that about is warranted. And one of the, one of the uh, kind of uh, vehicles of opportunity that you talk about are apprenticeships. Yes. And I wonder if you could uh, say a little about why you uh, are so high on apprenticeships, why you think there's so much potential there to help Because people. Not, not every kid can go to college. Uh, you know, some of them could learn skills. Right now, if you want to work in manufacturing, when I was a kid, if you want to get a job at a, you know, I was in Cleveland, Ohio. You, there was a lot of manufacturing there. There was manufacturing in close by Detroit and Youngstown and Akron. You could go get a job in a factory and, and within a couple of weeks, you know, you could be productive uh, because the tasks were simple. Uh, they were assembly line type tasks. Well, those days are gone. You know, now this is all automated. And so you can still get a job in a factory. As I said, there's like 400,000 openings in the manufacturing sector, but you need the training. You know, you need to learn how to run those machines. And it's not something you should have to go to college to do. It's something that, that you should be able to do within the business. You know, my, as Secretary of Labor, one thing I wanted to do was work very closely with the business community on, on jobs training because the business community knows what jobs are open, they know what skills they need. 
So when the federal government, I think the federal government spends something like 30 billion a year on, uh, on training and uh, really they should, we should be uh, doing that in conjunction with, uh, and, and the, um, uh, the, uh, the private sector play, spends like 300. You know, so we're, I, maybe, it's, maybe it's 30, it's not 30 million, it's 30 billion. It's either 30 million or 30 billion, I'm confused at the moment. But the private sector spends much more. We should spend with them uh, so that we can uh, have better job training, which was more effective, and, um, and got people into jobs that exist, not jobs that the government would like to pretend exist. Because the businesses know what skills they need, they know what... They know what the openings are, are, they know what they need, you know, why should we be training people to do something else? So one of the, one of the uh, reasons why some people are excited about apprenticeships is that businesses used to be much more willing to invest in that kind of training than they've become. And this is seen as a way to kind of encourage businesses to spend you know, more money and, and more time uh, hiring workers with general skills and then uh, training them in, in specific skills. Well, the businesses are going to have to start doing that because there's a shortage of employees now. There's too many jobs. Over the past, over the Obama administration years, businesses could be very picky about who they hired and who they trained because everybody was looking for jobs. You know, we, in, the, in the quick service restaurant industry, we had people that were clearly overqualified for the positions that they were filling, but that's the only jobs they could find. That's changing now. That's changing to where uh, we've got large businesses competing for qualified employees and needing to, uh, to train people to be qualified employees because there aren't enough of them. So this this is a this is a very exciting time for employees. Yeah. So uh, a hot economy is is making businesses do things that that they wouldn't do when they can be more selective. Yes. And this will reduce income inequality. It will drive up wages as employers compete for employees. It's a supply and demand, just like anything else. When the supply of laborers is low and the demand for laborers is high, the the value the uh, compensation for laborers will go up. It, look, it's, uh, you know, it's Kennedy's uh, rising tide, economic tide that lifts all boats. And that we, we are experiencing that. I wish there were still Democrats who believed it. Uh, it's too bad we're not the party of John Kennedy. It's too bad we're the party of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that you're seeing businesses do, at least, at least anecdotally, because this is all uh, relatively recent, is turning to hiring people with criminal records when they otherwise might not have done that. Do you have any thoughts about how to ease the transition from people who had committed felonies, had, had served prison time, uh, but, who were, but who were out and, and who were uh, ready to work and, and who want to work and uh, ways to kind of ease that transition into the, into the workforce and into productive lives? Well, again, I would do it working with businesses who need, who need employees. And you, know, you have to be very careful what you do in those circumstances. But we, don't, you know, we want to get the recidivist rate down. We don't want people going back to jail. Uh, we could have training in the prisons, which I think would be very helpful. And there's already a lot of that. But with the demand for employees increasing, it's something that we could certainly step up. So you know, there are a lot of things we could do. There, there, there are people who've made mistakes in life and you know, they need a second chance and they need to be part of the, part of the, uh, the incredible American dream, the incredible American economic system that we have uh, that for some reason, some people want to denigrate. I'm, I'm not... It's a, it's a mentality I just can't understand. I mean, all of the evidence goes against them, and yet they persist. <laughs> let me, let me uh, quote from the book, because this, this stood out to me. Um, you said, a priority of mine reflected my own experience. I got married and had a family at a young age. I felt that workplace policies should better reflect the needs of young families and that there was a role for government to push in that direction. Yes, I, I think there is. And can you, can you just say a little more about, about that? Sure, if we, what you can't do is overwhelm businesses. In other words, you can't you know, raise the taxes, increase regulation, uh, increase the minimum wage, require them to uh, provide daycare, require maternity leave, require paternity leave. You, know, you, can't, you can't keep piling on. But if you give businesses relief, there's probably some things you could do to encourage them uh, to implement some of these policies. And I think making sure that women are treated fairly in the workplace, which is, you know, it's difficult because women obviously have children and you have to, we have to adjust for that. And to try and make sure that people who have children aren't punished for having children. Those, there, those, there are policies that we could, um, we could push forth in those respects if we give businesses some relief so they can otherwise make money and stay in business and keep providing jobs. 
I w I've never been an opponent of all regulation. I think their regulation is important. I've, now, people need to understand a regulation is a tax. I mean, you pay for whatever regulations are out there. But I, I, I just wish that the government would try and design uh, regulations so that it takes into consideration the concerns of businesses. Uh, and that, that's been a, that was a big push of mine over the years of the Obama administration. It, it often fell on deaf ears, but um, I kept pushing it in different sectors. And uh, hopefully this is something that will, this, because it, it, this is something that'll come about because this regulatory state's out of control. It's just, out, it's a fourth branch of government that rules on its own. And we can't, you know, President Trump's been in office for over a year. He can't even get the people he wanted into the regulatory state to get things changed. So it's become a behemoth. And um, I, th I think by progressive design, so we need to take it down. So let me let me ask you about a, a point that you just made, and it, 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 it ties into the book. You're you're clear in the book on the need for workers to have strong protections, and you make that point. What sorts of protections do you think workers need? Uh, why do you think they're necessary? Um, and why do you think the the current protections are are not doing the trick? Well, I, actually, I think the current protections are, are pretty good. I think that we could probably do better than we're doing. You, you always can. And I'd like to see something with respect to child care. And I'd like to see something that um, made it easier for women in the workplace. But look, the unions used to take this role. The unions at one time took responsibility for protecting workers. Beginning in the Roosevelt administration, they ceded that authority to the federal government, whether it's the Wage and Hour Division, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, OSHA. I mean, there's any number of acronyms of organizations uh, or agencies in the federal government that now protect workers because the unions have kind of ceded their responsibility. They're no longer, uh, they're no longer the protectors of American workers. That's now the government. And in fact, they've lost, um, they've, they've lost touch with American workers. And I, I'm not saying that Unions weren't relevant in the last century. Uh, you know, who wanted 10-year-old kids working in coal mines? Well, nobody did. But even that, they've ceded that authority to the government. Uh, and so they, they now are out there trying to uh, establish their relevance and grow their membership through the government. That's why they end up uh, supporting ridiculous things like a $15 minimum wage that actually hurts the very employees that they claim they're trying to help by eliminating their jobs. Uh, the studies out of San Francisco and Seattle show that businesses close uh, when the wages go up. And in Seattle, it showed that the wages declined uh, because they had hours reduced. Uh, so it's, it, it's those kind of ridiculous policies. And, and the union members know that big labor is not in touch with their needs. And I think the best example of that is the last election, where despite putting over $100 million into the Hillary Clinton campaign coffers, um, the 42% of union households voted for Donald Trump. But what's more interesting is that includes government employee unions, and they want big government. You know, government employees want more money into government. If you just look at the private sector workers, it was more like 60% voted for Donald Trump despite the position of the labor leaders. Now, how out of touch could you possibly be with your membership? And you see this throughout the Southeast where you know, they can't, they can't, UAW can't unionize a car manufacturing plant. The factories reject them over and over and over. Uh, Boeing just rejected, the workers just rejected a union a couple years ago in South Carolina. So the, the unions have kind of ceded this authority to the government. So I think the government needs to step up and make sure that there isn't discrimination in the workplace. I think that's appropriate. You know, child labor laws are obviously important. Uh, uh, laws that protect people in the workplace are important. Now, you don't, you, you don't want to go overboard. I mean, the, uh, the safety people at our company used to say that the perfect restaurant for safety purposes were, was one that never opened. You know, and we don't, we don't want to get to the point where we're doing that. Uh, but I think government has a role in protecting workers, and I think it has a role in, in advocating for the interests of American workers. So would you be, would you be in favor of stronger unions? I would be in favor of stronger unions if they became more in touch with the, um, with the interest of their workers and less in touch with the interest of the big labor leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, where, for example, in this last election, you know, look, the, part, the, the candidate of the private sector union members was Donald Trump. He was their candidate on immigration. He was their candidate on trade, uh, yet they supported Hillary Clinton, because she was the candidate of big government, which justifies the labor leader's existence, 
because that's how they accomplish things now. They, they get legislation. They, they really can't do it on their own. Um, so let me, let me touch on international trade because you bring that up. And I'm going to quote from the book. You write, free trade can benefit everybody, but it is important to negotiate better trade deals with an eye toward protecting the working class from the pain those deals can bring. Yeah. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah, sure. If you're, if you're a, uh, and I'll even tie it into immigration, if you're working at a, I don't know, a manufacturing plant in Indiana and it closes, because it moves to Mexico uh, or, and, uh, and you go to try and get a job in construction and nobody speaks English, you know, try and convince that, that worker and you know, his, maybe your dad worked in that plant, your grandfather, try and convince that worker that you know, free trade and uh, liberal immigration policies are working in his best interest. Uh, you can't convince them of that because they're not working in his best interest. I think the important thing with international trade is that we have free we have free trade, but that it's also fair trade. I don't think unfair trade is free trade. You know, when we're paying a 25% tariff to sell an automobile in China, and they're paying a 2.5% tariff to sell one in the United States, that's not free trade. When we're paying a 10% tariff to sell Fords in Germany, or anywhere in the European Union, and they're paying 2.5% to sell you know, Saabs and Mercedes and BMWs in the United States, that, that's, not fair, that's not free trade because it's not fair trade. Uh, we've, we've got a president now who has stood up and said, you know what, um, if you guys don't start playing fair, we're, we're gonna start protecting ourselves. Now, I don't, I, it's, different to, it's different to impose tariffs because you wanna protect failing American businesses than it is to use tariffs as a negotiating tool to get people to the table so that you can enter into free trade agreements that are fair trade agreements. I think the best example is what happened recently in South Korea, where we had an agreement in 2011 or 12. Since then, our trade deficit increased like $31 billion a year. And, um, and the, the, the deficit on automobiles uh, in, in, in trade increased $33 billion a year. So the problem was obviously automobiles. So, the president went in and had his team negotiate a deal where they doubled the amount of automobiles that we could uh, import to South Korea without a tariff. Now, some people said, oh, we weren't importing that many automobiles to Korea anyway. Well, of course we wouldn't. We weren't because if you're, you're not going to advertise, uh, in a, you're not going to spend marketing dollars and try and design cars that meet the needs of South Korean people if your profits are capped. I mean, you can only spend so much. Now, if you double the cap, well, now maybe you'll invest. Now maybe you can sell some cars in that country. But that's, that's a, now, that didn't stop South Korea from selling cars in the United States. It just opened the South Korea market to our car manufacturers. That's free trade. It isn't free trade when they keep us out and we let them in. So I think that's what I'm talking about. There are things we can do to try and make that, or NAFTA. You know, you wanna know the president's philosophy on negotiating. You know, pretend you're the guy who's negotiating with Canada and Mexico right now. And the president comes out and says, we're going to put tariffs on steel and aluminum. Now, there are, there are national defense issues with those tariffs, so they're a little different than other tariffs. But let's pretend they're not different. And really, there aren't national defense concerns really with Canada and Mexico. So you go in and you're negotiating, and all of a sudden, the Canadians and Mexicans go crazy. You know, God, you're going to put tariffs on steel and aluminum that we import to your country or export to your country. And... Uh, and the president comes out and says, you know, tell you what, during the negotiations, we're not going to impose those tariffs. Now, if you were the guy negotiating with Mexico and China, do you think you were in a stronger negotiating position or a weaker negotiating position before the president made those statements? Well, obviously, now you're in a stronger negotiating position. You've, you've really got China and Mexico a little concerned that there could be real problems if they don't negotiate on this NAFTA deal. So, this, I, this is the kind of thing I think that, that scares people in the uh, academic ivory towers or scares journalists who, you know, have never really negotiated a deal. But I think American businesses are kind of laughing and going, you know, this guy knows what he's doing. I Do think, think we're going to make some progress here. And, and you think it'll be effective? You think it'll I think be it'll be very, look, it's already brought China to the table. Everybody got, about a week ago, Xi, Xi Jinping came out and said, uh, you know, I guess maybe we do need to look into this uh, taking your intellectual property and these tariffs and this kind of thing. And of course, the left media all came out and said, oh, my God, he would have done that anyway. And, 
That's what they said about the Soviet Union under Reagan. would have fallen anyway. Anyway, they come out and say this. He would have done this anyway, and this doesn't mean that much. I, well, I'll tell, you what it, it, I'll tell you what it meant. It wasn't the individual things he said. What he said through that speech, through referring to those individual things was, I'm at the table. You know, now you got me at the table. And that was the point. We need to have these people at the table. You've got three presidents, Carter, excuse me, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, who tried to get China to negotiate. You know, look, you're, you're, what you're doing is unfair. You're cheating us. We're going to go to the World Trade Organization. Uh, you know, this isn't right. We're a big trading partner. And uh, they went home and laughed. And now, now maybe they're not laughing. You know, now maybe it's time to cut a deal with China mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't eliminate free trade, but makes it fair trade. Um, Andy Puzder, thank you very much for being here. Congratulations. I hope people weren't taking notes because it's all in the book. <laughs> <laughs> you can get the book and you can go through and, uh, uh, and I, I hope people will get the book. And it, it's, it is designed to give people ammunition to defend this president's policies and also so they can share with others these kind of undercovered economic achievements. You know, I'm tired of hearing about Stormy Daniels. I want to hear more about how fewer people are on the unemployment rolls than have been on them in 44 years or, or that uh, North Korea is coming to the negotiating table. But all, all of this is in the book. And if you read it after you read it, if you buy the book and you read it, please give it to your kids and give it to you know, your, your grandkids, people that are in high school and college, because I guarantee you, they're not learning this stuff in high school and college. And congratulations on all the success it's had. Thank um, you so much. And uh, just a reminder again that all the profits are going to charity and, and, yep. and to some worthy causes. So thank you again for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Andrew Puzder. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, remember to like the video or leave us a comment. And be sure to check out the rest of our videos and research from AEI.